We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. The goal of this series is to help you better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. The Institute is a professional association, advanced education provider, and standards body for financial advisors, investment consultants, financial planners, and wealth managers who embrace excellence and ethics. Through our events, continuing education courses, and the claim certifications, which include the Certified Investment Management Analyst, the Certified Private Wealth Advisor, and Retirement Management Advisor certifications, we deliver Ivy League and practical education for investment and wealth professionals. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. I serve as the editor of the Retirement Management Journal, which is published by the Investments and Wealth Institute, and I also serve as the editor of Retirement Daily, which is published by The Street. My guest today is Cindy Tagliero, a senior researcher with the Vanguard Investment Strategy Group, and she's co-author of Assessing the Value of Advice, a paper published by Vanguard Research in 2019. So welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Bob. I'm happy to be here today. Pleasure to have you on. Now, for the benefit of those folks who may be listening and may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a brief overview? Oh, sure, sure. Um, So I am a senior researcher at Vanguard. I work um, in our investor investor behavior unit um, as a part of our investment strategy group. So I work with our thought leadership team. And I've been with the team for over a decade now and spend much of my time doing research on investor behavior, specifically focused on advised investors. Um, So that's the, the topic of our work today. And I'm specifically going to talk about a paper that we published last September called Assessing the Value of Advice. Right. So obviously our audience are advisors who are members of the Investments and in Wealth Institute, and uh, and they spend their days giving investment and financial advice. Um, so let's start by maybe you, you, have, you giving us an overview of why it's so important to research this topic of the value of advice. Oh, sure. So we know there's a number of forces driving change in the advisory industry. Um, You know, we have a lot of rise in consumer demand. And at the same time, technology is making advice much more available to investors at lower cost. But at the same time, we have this need to demonstrate value for money. So is the value of advice worth the cost to the investor? So as an industry, I think it's really important for all of us to better understand this whole concept of value. And then we can develop metrics to actually demonstrate that value for money. So that's why we think the research is so important. Mm. And, and before we get into the research that was published in September, just a, a, a comment, if you could, this paper or the series of papers that you'll be publishing uh, comes on the heels of other work that you've done and others like David Blanchett have done where everyone has, not everyone, but some are trying to Figure out the value advice, right? That if we could place in context your your, your work relative to your, the previous work that Vanguard's done and, and others have done. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, research on this topic is not new. You know, in fact, at Vanguard, we began studying this topic way back in 2001 with the first issue of Advisors Alpha. And as you mentioned, there's a a number of other groups like Morningstar and Dave Blanchett that are looking at this. Um, I met with a company in the UK called Quilter that uh, has their Delta. You know, you have your Morningstar Gamma Advisor Alpha Quilter Delta. So pick your Greek letter. But certainly all of this is uh, great work. And more recently, we've seen some robo-advisors like Betterment, United Income, make their own attempt to come out and try to quantify the value of their advice. Um, Many of these studies um, include simulations. You include hypothetical models. We're starting to see more more data-driven studies, that is, um, using actual client data. So there's a number of academic studies now um, that have somewhat conflicting in results. Um, So we think we're just contributing to the broader literature on this topic. And certainly, our focus is really to start shifting towards more quantitative analysis and really leveraging actual actual advised client data. Okay. So this paper that you did in September, it it spans that the body of knowledge. It it introduces a three-part value framework for uh, advice. Uh, So could you describe that uh, framework and perhaps how it's different from the advisor's alpha work that you had done? 
64? Oh, uh, yes, certainly, certainly. So the framework that we propose in this paper consists of three dimensions. So when we think about value to an advised investor, we think about it in three components. The first is portfolio value, the second being financial value, and the third being emotional value. So it's a much more holistic overview of um, the value of advice than what we traditionally would think of. Now, you know, none of the components in and of themselves are not new. Um, certainly, you know, when we first did the advisor's alpha work, you can see there's some similarity into the framework. I think this view is really just organizing the themes a little bit differently to better assess investor outcomes. So we're shifting from you know, just the portfolio value to broader wealth value from just the functional components to, to include more emotional components. And again, I just want to emphasize that need to move from simulated-based modeling to more quantitative-based modeling. Mm -hmm. and, and how's the framework different from the work that you, Vanguard did with the Advisors Alpha? Is there some points of differentiation? So, yeah, again, I would just say yeah, I, I would say I always think of it as an evolution. So, um, you know, just we're evolving the concept. If you look at the original advisor alpha framework, I think there were four components and one um, component behavioral coaching was specifically called out. I think what we've realized over time is behavioral coaching is a very important component, but it really is part of a broader framework of what we consider emotional values. So the whole concept of emotional value is much more complex. So we think these three larger dimensions really encompassed holistic value. Hmm. So in, in this uh, first paper on the subject, you present out, uh, one outcome from each of the pillars, portfolio value, financial value, and emotional value. So let's start with portfolio value and the, and the quality of portfolio construction. Can you tell us a bit about the research that examined uh, equity risk-taking and some of the key findings in that, uh, in that pillar? Oh, sure. Absolutely. And just to take a step back. So what we did is we wanted to really highlight the breadth of the framework and really illustrate, you know, how we can look at so many dimensions of value within the framework. So what we chose to do is leverage data from our advised investor base. Um, these are individuals who invest with our personal advisor services. And we wanted to highlight, again, the breadth of the service by looking at just one component in each. So for the portfolio dimension, what we chose to focus on was the quality of portfolio construction. And specifically, what we wanted to look at um, was compare or understand how advice influenced portfolio construction, or more specifically, how it addressed what we consider known investor errors when it comes to constructing portfolios. So we took a sample of about 50,000 investors and we compared their portfolios six months before and six months after advice adoption. And uh, again, what we know is we know that investors left to their own devices demonstrate specific um, portfolio investment. I, I hesitate to call them errors, um, but we know that they make some not so great choices. So one thing we know for sure is um, people will take inappropriate levels of risk. Um, and there's a lot of research that demonstrates that. They either take too much or too little. So certainly one aspect of advice that's very helpful is really correcting that decision. So in the paper, we took a, a close look at equity allocation before and after the adoption of advice. Now, if we were to look at it in aggregate, we see, um, you know, on average, there was very little shift. But at the client level, there's certainly a huge impact. And um, in terms of equity share, what we found that is for two thirds of our investors, um, two thirds of those investors, excuse me, required a meaningful change of at least 10 percentage points. About half needed a meaningful increase in equity and about half needed a meaningful decrease. So it was pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So when when you look at the changes that take place uh, when when a client is advice assisted, talk a little bit about the you know maybe some of the implications for advisors and their clients. Is, is it that their portfolios become uh, uh, more well diversified and better able to generate after tax risk adjusted returns? Is that sort of the 
the the net goal of of that? Well, I mean, it's certainly one goal. I, I think where what we're demonstrating here when we look at the portfolio is we're just acknowledging or excuse me, what we notice is that we know people make certain types of errors. We know that people take inappropriate levels of risk. People tend to um, hold money in cash. You have people who like to invest in individual stocks and uh, they don't always do that very well and it, and it composes um, too much of their portfolio. We also see a considerable amount of home bias. So in this particular study, we looked at all of those various attributes and, and demonstrated how um, the advisory service and the advisor could really help correct and deal with those, um, those different behavioral biases. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in terms of the, uh, I think part of the research, there, there's a, another paper that uh, will be coming out uh, that way you do a deeper dive into into uh, portfolio value. And uh, in that paper, there's some other findings with regard to investors taking a more disciplined approach to their investing and and their asset allocations. Uh, yes, absolutely. And that paper will be forthcoming. And um, basically, it is a deeper dive of this first study that we um, just highlight in the paper. One of the things that we do illustrate is we looked at um, age-based equity allocations. Um, and it's one of my favorite charts in the paper, actually, because what we do is we compare um, the portfolio, again, pre and post advice adoption, but we look at average the distribution of average equity allocations by age prior to advice. And there's a graph in the paper that I love because basically the distribution is all over the place. So it's just a big swath of blue across that chart, which shows that at every age, there's a wide dispersion of equity allocation. At the same time, after advice, when you look at that same picture, you see that um, that swath of blue just narrow um, dramatically, which again, highlights the disciplined approach to professional advice, right? So all of those extreme allocations are are um, reduced and everybody is in a much more um, appropriate glide path for their particular goal. So that was one of the additional findings we share um, in that paper too. I also speak a little bit more detailed about how we even arrived at the understanding of um, of these biases that we see. So basically the analysis that we did just took investors, it looked at the portfolio choices they made before adopting advice. And then we looked at the changes required um, to improve their portfolios. And that's when we noticed all of these um, different behaviors. We noticed, again, people taking too much risk. We saw um, people with a lot of stock ex single stock exposure, people who love to invest in cash. And we actually break down those metrics to um, highlight how much of a change actually occurred. So as an example, you know, cash dwellers made up about 14% of that group. But if we looked at them, they held on average over 77% of their portfolio in cash. So obviously, we made some very significant adjustments there. Same with stock investors. While they were a very small group, um, when they did hold stock, it was typically nearly half of their portfolio. So they're exposing themselves to quite a bit of single stock risk. So obviously, um, the advisory service will help improve that. Mm -hmm. And it seems like advisors are probably aware of home bias, but individual investors may not have an advisor, may not be aware of, of home bias. And, and the advice seems to eliminate that for, I think the stat is over 90%, which seems significant. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't think people realize they are home bias, but certainly from an investment strategy standpoint, it's great to have some global exposure. And um, certainly, you know, that's a part of um, what we prescribe. And so for this particular sample, yes, nine in 10 people required really meaningful changes to their international exposure. Mm -hmm. Um, the paper also concludes that advice, and you've already suggested this, that it appears to remedy these common portfolio errors uh, that yes. are attributable to cognitive or behavioral biases or lack of financial literacy. Can you just sort of talk a little bit about what those biases, those specific biases might be? And, uh, and also with respect to the lack of financial literacy, what people can do with or without an advisor 
uh, to maybe become more financially literate and, and not be so, um, uh, make these errors with their portfolios. Yeah, well, that's a, certainly a tall order. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with your uh, the first part of the question first. Um, you know, like I said, so we have a lot of research that's been demonstrated that um, people just take inappropriate levels of risk. You know, some people are overly aggressive. Others are overly cautious. There could be a variety of reasons for that. You know, um, certainly somebody, if we had particularly bad market you know, um, market conditions over a decade ago could certainly cause some fear for some people. You know, some people are a little bit overconfident in their abilities to actually invest their own money. You know, as in terms of like cash, again, I it's it, it could be an artifact if people are just really, really conservative. Or, you know, it could be people are suffering from a bit of inertia. You know, we do see behaviors where people intend to do something. So they might roll over an IRA and put it into a money market account and with the intent of reinvesting it, but they don't get there. So they basically just kind of park their money and left it there. So those are just some of the examples. With respect to the lack of financial literacy, I mean, just... um, there's a, a great body of work um, by a local professor here and some of her co-authors um, from the Wharton School does some wonderful work on uh, financial literacy. And, and just broadly, we know that just not here in the U.S., but across the globe, you know, there is quite a bit of financial Ill- illiteracy. It's un- it's unfortunate. So, I mean, I would suggest to individual investors that there just are very simple ways to seek out good information. I know um, here as a provider here at Vanguard, we provide great educational tools on our websites to help people just even develop a basic understanding of investment and investing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Mitchell and, uh, and Dr. Lusari have done some wonderful work around financial literacy. And, yes. and, uh, and, uh, and I've yes. read their research and it seems interesting that um, for some people, if they were just to become familiar with five basic concepts, uh, that, that it would go a long way toward uh, helping them improve outcomes perhaps. Yeah, abs- absolutely. I'm always continuously shocked to, when I read um, the results of their studies. It's just amazing to me just how prevalent the lack of literacy is. Uh, topic for another day, I suppose. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We could spend an hour on that topic alone. So uh, are there other things about the portfolio outcome pillar that we should touch on before we move on to the other two pillars? Uh, no, I think we've covered that. Um, I think we've covered that topic pretty well. Again, like I said, I think the benefit what that we were trying to highlight in this pillar is that we know that, again, we said that people have biases. They may lack um, financial literacy when it comes to investments. And here's where professional advice is very beneficial. Okay. So uh, the other, the second pillar component of the value advice is financial uh, financial value. And can you tell us a little bit about the study that you conducted there with respect to outcomes, uh, the metrics you chose to study and why, and, and what's the opportunity for advisors given your findings? Oh, absolutely. So the second pillar is, uh, you know, the financial value where we focused on financial outcomes. And this one is really all about goal attainment. So, you know, where the portfolio pillar was really focused on all things related to the portfolio, this is a much broader financial category. So if we think about overall wealth planning, so there is a multitude of metrics we could study within uh, this pillar, but we chose to focus on success rates. Um, The reason we focus on success rates is one, it is the metric that we deliver to our advised clients. It is a very good outcome based metric. And it's also very salient to our clients. So we thought it would be a good one um, to look at. So for every client, we report a success rate. So they will come to us and they will set a financial goal. Most people, um, they can set multiple goals, but for us, most people set an individual goal, and that is retirement. And um, basically, their default goal would be reaching age 100 with $1 in assets. And so they certainly have the opportunity to revise that goal if they wish. Uh, most don't, uh, interestingly. Um, but uh, so what we do is we create a projection for them. basically a a model that tells them what is the probability of success given their current situation that they will achieve that goal. And what we did is we collected that metric um, at one specific point in time for over 100,000 investors. And we did just a 
broad distribution to understand and see who's on track, who's close to being on track, and, and who needs a little bit more help. And I think uh, one of the values of this metric is it just gives you a great overview of the book of business and understanding who's in good shape, who needs you know, more assistance. And in the example we provide in the paper, among these clients, we actually have a really great news story because 80% of these clients have over an 80% probability of achieving their goals. So that's a very high number. Um, We do have a small group that are are off track um, or below that number and a a very small group that are at the the tail end of the distribution. So they definitely have some challenges and and certainly an opportunity with the advisor to work with them and help them make decisions that will help them better get closer to achieving their goal. Hmm. So for the 80% that are on track, I think the paper mentioned that there's an, it highlights um, an opportunity for advisors as some may be overly prepared for retirement. Could you sort of just tell us what that means and what the opportunity is for folks who are on track but maybe overprepared? Yes. So it was certainly is an interesting observation that we made. I mean, certainly no one wants to run out of money, right? People want to be able to achieve their financial goals. But some folks with these very high probabilities of success, um, I mean, the median number was near 100% success. It really does open up that uh, window and say, you know, let's take a look at that situation. Perhaps it's, um, you know, this fear of spending or, you know, just this over, over, overwhelming need to just hang on to that money. Um, but it's certainly an opportunity to say, hey, look, maybe if we made this change or this change, maybe you can take a nice vacation or maybe share some of that bequest money a little bit earlier. And we could take a look and see what kind of impact that has on success. Chances are probably, you know, depending on how much it is, you know, going from 99% down to 90% might free up some money for people um, to enjoy it. I mean, we can't take it with us, right? So, um, maybe there's an opportunity to just encourage people to revisit their plan and see if they can um, free up a little bit more of that money for spending and enjoyment now, as opposed to just holding on to it. Mm. The the research also seemed to suggest, at least for the 20% of folks who may not be on track, is that you may not have complete information, which is uh, certainly true for some advisors that may not have access to all their client accounts. They're dealing with maybe uh, a, a person's IRA or their taxable accounts, or maybe both, but maybe, but not maybe their 401k plan. So there's there's a need. It seems like on the part of the advisor to take a very holistic approach and make sure that they've captured all the assets that are being earmarked for retirement or whatever the goal might be. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, and we certainly saw that. Um, So first, we are reliant on people to provide all of the relevant information that we need to make that plan. But um, one thing we did notice is we took a closer look at those folks in in, down at the tail end of the distribution. And we did notice that where they were younger than the other investors. And when we think about savings among younger individuals, most of their savings occurs in a workplace plan. And so we are really counting on them to tell us not only the savings that they're putting in, but if there is a match, which it can be very significant, if there's an additional employer contribution. So all of that information is very, very helpful. And um, so we do suspect that we probably don't have complete information. But like you said, it's really, um, it's on the advisor to really tease out and get all of that relevant information. Right. And, And also, I think in your paper, with respect to financial value, you go uh, look at things beyond savings and spending behavior. You're looking at non-financial capital issues like debt levels or insurance and risk management and estate planning issues as well in terms of uh, these financial goals being attained. Uh, Absolutely. Like I said, um, the whole goal of the paper was to present a much more comprehensive and holistic view of value. So when we think about the items that you mentioned, all of those and all of those items and the assistance of advisors in working with those topics is adding value to the client. It's adding value in that relationship. So they need to be considered. Uh, Certainly, yes. (laughs) 
So then the, the last pillar has to do with uh, emotional value or, or emotional outcomes. Can you tell us about the research there and the challenges of conducting that research and key findings? Sure, absolutely. So um, this is by far the most difficult pillar to manage, right? So first I want to mention that we felt it was really important to include the emotional pillar in our broader framework. Uh, I know many people have long hypothesized that emotional value is there. It's just we just don't know how to think about it. We don't know how to measure it, but we know it exists. So what we wanted to do is try to develop a way to kind of quantify what emotional value is. So if you think about an investor, they have this perceived, you know, this kind of overall value perception and really, really wanted to tease out how much of that was truly emotional. So this is really our first foray into the topic. And what we did is we fielded a survey. We did a multidimensional survey of 3,000 U.S. investors. And multidimensional meaning that we conducted qualitative interviews because we wanted to understand when we asked investors, how do you value advice? What is value to you? It really helped us formulate a survey so we could create what we call these need statements that we could measure and try to identify what's important. So people would give us value statements like, oh, I want to maximize re returns. Or I need help with savings to that, you know, are very functional to very emotional things. Like I need to trust my advisor. Or I need a personal connection with my advisor. So we conducted the survey. Um, we actually looked at a number of different types of advised investors. So we looked at um, people who we consider traditionally advised. So these are people that um, usually work face to face with an, an advisor. We looked at robo advised advised investors, and then we looked at a more hybrid model. Um, which is our offer, which is basically combining both human and algorithmic elements. So in this particular paper, we just looked at our, um, our personal advisor clients and we looked at the results of the survey. And they were very, very enlightening, um, confirmed much of what my co-author and I suspected, which is um, there is a significant emotional component um, to the value proposition for advice. We saw very strong value with respect to a relationship with a trusted advisor. Um, it was um, by far the strongest. So attributes that, you know, uh, relate to trust and personal connection and having an expert to help with investment decisions, all of those were very important. For this particular group, we also saw this need for what we call protection and assurance. So this was very highly valued. So feeling the need that um, they're on track, um, knowing that survivors would be cared for in the event of an emergency, um, this whole idea of reassurance that things will be okay even in and a market downturn. And then we still saw um, what was less relatively speaking important, but still important were the concept of pl those traditional planning attributes. So I, I like to highlight that this in this bucket, we consider like, I need to maximize my investment returns relative to things like trust and personal connection and protection. This is actually relatively unimportant. So I thought that was very interesting. I, I do want to say you asked what was difficult about this. One significant learning that um, my co-author and I had on this um, during the study was when we designed our survey questions, we broke them down into um, our various dimensions of our framework. You know, we asked financial, things that were financial, portfolio, and emotionally related. And one thing that our analysis um, really uncovered for us is emotion and the, the whole idea of the of emotion runs through all of these value statements just to varying degrees. So things that we actually thought were pretty um, functional, for some were very, very emotional. And um, so we really had to work to develop a tool or a metric that would help us really tease out that emotional component. And when we did that, we found, um, we in the paper we reported as 45%, that 
of the overall value proposition, about 45% is purely emotionally related, which is pretty significant. So it's not the 45, 41, 40%. It's um, really, it's recognizing that a huge chunk um, is emotionally related. And I think that's a really important finding. Hmm. So when you think about that, the, the fact that it's so heavily weighted toward uh, emotional value, uh, it seems like the paper also gives advisors perhaps a roadmap for um, achieving that, which would be those three value attributes that you've described about continuous plan monitoring, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and if they were to do those things, that they would maybe increase the chances of, of, of fulfilling their advice yeah. and delivering value delivering you know I think the way I would guide advisors to to consume this research is in the paper we list the 24 statements that we asked and I think one thing that I would advise advisors would be to recognize that um, emotion has many facets and um, it's a really broad topic and when we classically think of emotion we think you know of like I'll go to behavioral coaching you know people being worried and down markets and things like that but we found that other emotions are very highly valued things like um, the feeling of accomplishment for taking charge of a financial plan right or or a sense of pride in doing that Um, feeling that whole feeling of being on track these are all very positive emotions. So I think it really is helpful to the advisor to recognize that it can come in many forms. And and I suggest that they, you know, think about the various attributes they've that we've listed and find a way to kind of get that information out of their client when they're meeting with them so they can understand what is really driving the emotion for them. Mm-hmm. It would me a little bit, if I could just to turn to behavioral coaching for a second, uh, we've witnessed at the Investments and Wealth Institute, for instance, there's now a conference that focuses on behavioral coaching. Uh, the CFP board has, has put in place uh, uh, a curriculum around behavioral coaching, et cetera. And it, so it seems like this is now becoming a, as, as important as it once was to uh, learn about how to construct a portfolio. It's now critically important to, to sort of become uh, engage from a behavioral perspective with your clients and understand whatever, like you said before, cognitive and behavioral biases, et cetera. Oh, absolutely. Behavioral coaching is extremely important in it, and it's been a it's been a longstanding pillar of our advisors alpha framework. I think where um, where I think this newer research is contributing is again just expanding that idea of emotional value. So now behavioral co- coaching becomes just a part of that broader and more complex view of emotional value. So I think it's going to be interesting to start um, evolving that concept as we learn more and more about the importance of this emotional value. Mm-hmm. So what? Uh, do you think advisors should be doing more or more of or less of to demonstrate their value uh, to clients and prospects or the things that we haven't touched on that uh, would be worth mentioning? Well, I, yeah, I, I think the way um, I would really, you know, the message that we have for advisors in the paper is first and foremost, when we start thinking about value, we need to take a much more holistic view of what value is, you know, so it's not just focusing on the portfolio outcome, because we know that investors have other sources of value. So it's being more holistic in that view. The other is, you know, I will say as an industry, we're in a very relatively nascent stage of thinking about how to provide unified metrics of value, but we need to start moving in that direction, right? So I I would encourage people to start thinking about data and analytics and, and how we can come up with good measures that we can deliver you know, to the client and have them understand, obviously, using these measures, how we are providing value to them. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit uh, about the next bit of research that you plan to conduct about the value of advice? Oh, sure. So, you know, we've touched on it a little bit, but so this framing paper or the framework paper actually illustrated three separate studies that we have in flight. Uh, Happy to report that two of the three papers will um, be out uh, relatively soon. So we've 
talked about the first, which was a deeper dive into that idea of improving portfolio diversification. We also have a paper that takes a much closer look at the survey we did on emotional value and where we share the results for our um, Vanguard advice clients in the paper that we're discussing today. In the paper that we will be publishing, we focus specifically on traditionally advised um, investors as well as robo-advised investors. So both of these we'll expect to be out by the springtime. And then um, the third paper that relates to um, the, the financial outcomes metric will have out later in the year. And then addition to, in addition to all that work, um, we're really excited to expand on this idea of emotional value. We feel like we've just broken ground on this topic. And so we're looking to expand our work in this area, particularly around this concept of financial well-being. So um, we're going to look to do a lot more work in that area this year. I have to say, I, I have to applaud uh, you and Vanguard for, there's a statement in the research that says that this framework, that you present this framework as uh, uh, as uh, as uh, not the necessarily the, the definitive definition of the value advice, but but as a way to generate more dialogue and that you welcome contributions from others. And, and I think about, you know, the fact that this is a new and an emerging field of research that, uh, that it, that, this, you are expanding the body of knowledge here uh, should give others, I think, um, uh, impetus and incentive to, uh, to to keep researching this because obviously advisors for advisors this is a key question. How do I demonstrate the value to my uh, the value of my advice to a client? Yeah, well, thank you that for that comment. I mean, certainly, you know, we're always open to input from others. I mean, across the industry, we're all helping each other by exploring and researching these various topics and learning from one another. I mean, I avidly consume a lot of research, you know, particularly from David at Morningstar and others. It's really important to understand and learn from one another and what, you know, one person might have an idea that somebody can go off and explore further. So we're more than happy to generate dialogue on the topic. I mean, obviously, this whole concept of value for money is really, really important. So I think the more people that are contributing to the field, the better. Mm. Great. Anything that we haven't touched upon that you think our listeners should know before we, uh, before we wrap up? Um, I think we've really had a great discussion today. We certainly covered a lot of ground. Um, I think the things that I would just like to highlight is, again, we're more than open to feedback on the framework and love to have discussions about that. So certainly want to encourage that. And I think, too, I just want to echo this message of um, starting to think about data and analytics in our field and how we can start expanding our work in that area where we're really providing good metrics to our clients. Okay. Thank you very much, Bobby. Appreciate it. It was great to be here today. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to our podcast. My guest today was Cindy Pagliaro, a senior researcher with the Vanguard Investment Strategy Group. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. The Investment and Wealth Institute has been helping investment and wealth professionals become exceptional advisors for over 30 years. Please visit us at our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org to learn more about our certifications, conferences, online learning, and continuing education programs.